This is a Going Back Remembering UGA interview with Claude Williams, Jr., conducted by Claude McBride on September the 9th, 209, at the historic Ray Nicholson House in Athens. Claude, thank you for allowing us to have this conversation with you today. My pleasure. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us something about your early years and your family while you were growing up. Well, I was born in uh, Tifton, Georgia, South Georgia, where my father was in the wholesale grocery business. And uh, as a lot of businesses and people can appreciate in today's environment, uh, the stock market crash in 29 uh, caused my father and his younger brother's business to uh, uh, fail. He was uh, advised to take bankruptcy, but uh, he said, no, I can't do that, and if I'm fortunate enough to live long enough, I'll repay my debts. And one of the stories that he tells about this, Claude, that I like to repeat, and it is applicable to many people today, considering what uh, we've been through and are going through, uh, they bought uh, the wholesale grocery business and they sold to mom and prop grocery stores. There weren't any supermarkets as we know them today. And it was all on the credit. And uh, they bought a carload of sugar when it was shipped from the refinery in Indiana. By the time it arrived about two weeks later in Tifton, Georgia, the price of sugar had dropped $5,000 for that carload. So that was an example of what they faced. My father was in the post office in Gainesville, his first job in 1906. And as a result, in 1929, he was able to reapply to the post office and civil service gave him preference over someone who was applying for a job that had never been in a post office before. Mm -hmm. So we moved back to Commerce, Georgia, and lived with my grandfather, my mother's family. He was a farmer merchant in commerce, a uh, very successful businessman, had a big home, lots of servants, and uh, we were welcome there. We lived there a year while my father was able to get back in the post office in Gainesville. So That's I entered Gainesville in the third grade. In third and, grade. And went on through high school in Gainesville. What was Gainesville like at that time? Well, quite different from what it is today. Much smaller city than it is uh, it is now. I made some sort of lifelong friends, some of which I, others are still living, fortunate enough. <laughs> and uh, uh, but it was a very small town, a square, uh, Gainesville High, Red Elephants. Red Elephants. Red yeah. elephants. So you grew up there? I grew up in Gainesville, yes. And went graduated to from public school. And went to public schools in Gainesville. Then you went off to college? Went off to college, to North Georgia College in Dahlonega in 1940. And it was a two-year military school at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, following that, I came down to the university. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when you came to the university, you enrolled in a special program that they had? Then? Well, I was in advanced ROTC, and when uh, Pearl Harbor came in December of 41, I would have gone to camp the next summer as a junior in the ROTC under normal conditions, and with the war on, they suspended that program, and there were several thousand uh, people like myself who were in uh, advanced ROTC, infantry and cavalry, and that's what Georgia had. And uh, so they decided to induct us in the Army and took us to Fort McPherson in Atlanta, inducted us in privates. And you mentioned this interview being in the historical Ray Nicholson, Ray Nicholson home. Well, right across the street Nicholson. on the uh, corner of uh, Lumpkin and what's that small street's name? Ray Street. Ray Street. Uh, was the Bickerstaff boarding house, and they rented it for us. There were 42 of us, had an army sergeant. The only thing we had to do military-wise, other than take military classes, was fall out at 6.30 in the morning on the side street and take 30 minutes of calisthenics. Yeah. And we wore civilian clothes, and the army paid for our 
military paid for our schooling, which was quite a mm -hmm. uh, nice thing at that time. Because Did you have your meals at the Bickerstaff boarding house? Or? No, we had our meals. They bought us meal tickets at the Beanery, which was the university cafeteria right across the street. Denmark Hall. Now right. the School of Environmental Design, I believe. Uh -huh. or they may have moved since I last knew, uh -huh. but that's where it was. And then you took regular classes at the took university? regular classes and uh, went to school for 12 months. And so I graduated from Georgia with over 200 hours because I was a private in the Army and did what they told me to do. And I stayed here and just kept taking courses even though I had more than graduate. But I graduated in absentia with a class of 44 with an A.B. in history. I like Dr. W.O. Payne who uh -huh. was faculty chairman of athletics, uh -huh. a great uh, teacher. Uh, you want to talk a little about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the, the several things I remember about Dr. Payne, but one is love of athletics. And I actually had a class with Frank Sinkwich, one of Dr. Payne's history classes. In fact, that's how I came to major in history because I did not know how long would I I'd be here in the military and so I loved Dr. Payne's courses and took everything he had because mm -hmm. <laughs> he said so the army just left me here and uh, one of the, we played Alabama uh, and Dr. Payne was one of the few professors on the campus that would not hold Saturday classes. University had classes on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. He said no, he had such stature in the university faculty and the university community that he pretty much could do what he wanted to. So he had no classes on Saturday. And he told us, he said, I know that Mr. Sinkwich is prepared. And he called everybody Mr. And he called all the ladies Miss. And uh, he, he said on, on uh, Wednesday, he dismissed class for the rest of the week because he said, we've got to get ready to beat Alabama on Saturday. On Saturday. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons we liked his course. The other, the other was that he said at the beginning of the class, I will call the roll one time. And this was, this was after the time you had to switch courses. If people will remember, there was a certain week or 10 day period when you could actually switch to another course for various reasons. But when the final roster came in for Dr. Payne's class, he would call the roll. And he said, one time I will call it. I will not call it again. But ladies and gentlemen, don't think just because I do not call the roll that I do not know who is present here. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing he did, he said, everyone that completes my course will get a satisfactory grade. And then he would pause and say, and the reason for that is that every examination I give and that was back when we had the blue books and mm -hmm. you wrote everything mm -hmm. you knew about it and history was very conducive to that. Not like science where it's <laughs> got to come out exactly. Uh, and he would give us 15, he would put 15 questions on the blackboard and say the midterm exam or mid-quarter exam as we had then will be 10 of these 15 questions. And then he would always chuckle and say, if you know which 10 they are, only study those. <laughs> but because you do not know, I suggest you study all 15. Well, you had to be real dumb not to go to the library and spend a little time and be prepared to write something uh -huh. uh, in that blue book about every question. And then the other thing he did, he called everybody in that was new to his class. He assigned a time for you to meet him in his office. And he sat like we're sitting now. He didn't sit behind his desk, but he came over and sat in a chair facing you. And he would say, just like you did to me, Claude, he would say, Mr. Williams, you are from Gainesville, Georgia. Now tell me about a little, a little bit about your community and about your family. <laughs> and then it would proceed that he knew probably more people in your little town in Georgia than you did, I guess, from interviewing students mm -hmm. over the years. But you learned a lot from him and that. But he knew who you were, and uh, you had to make, and I made the best grades, obviously, in, uh -huh. in the history. I was not very good in foreign languages and mathematics, but being a 
uh, talker as people have accused me of being a <laughs> writer to some extent and a broadcaster. Uh, talking was more natural for me than. They named, um, have a dormitory name for Dr. Payne, don't they? All yeah. of his classes were in the administration building, second mm -hmm. floor, that's where mm -hmm. they were. And um, he, at one time, the athletes, I know all the freshmen lived there in Payne Hall. They did, that was named for him. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've got a group that get together for lunch and Jack Bush was asked back in the 40s, where did the football players <laughs> live? And he said, they lived over in Payne Hall. Right, <laughs> and, uh, that's uh, right. He was a great character. What was the campus like then, and the stadium? And well, very small. Most of our classes were held on what would be the main campus past the arch now. In fact, the, the, the uh, military building is the same building that we have today. I think there's been an addition made to it. Fine arts building had just been completed. But that was about the extent of the college, except for Ag Hill. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, they built a couple of dormitories over on Ag Hill, and uh, but all of my classes were held right up here on main campus. Uh, most of the men were either going to the army or already in the army, mm -hmm. so uh, there was a lot more women. And freshmen, sophomore women were out at where the Navy School is now, called the Coordinate Campus. Mm -hmm. They did not even take classes. If you came to the University of Georgia as a freshman or sophomore in those days, you went to essentially an ex a girls' school. <laughs> and you had all your classes out there together. It was not until you became a junior or senior that you came to classes down on the main campus. Now, men did not do like that, mm -hmm. but they had the uh, co op, which was up in old college, I mean, in new college, ground floor of new college on the end toward old college. and. Uh, uh, it was called jellying at the co-op, and so if you, between classes, that's what people did. We jellied at the co-op, uh -huh. went in there and visited, and if you had a nickel or a dime, you'd buy yourself a drink, but most of us mm -hmm. didn't have one of that, so. The co-op was sort of a lounge with? It was sort of a, a little uh, sandwich shop uh -huh. for students, and then the beanery, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And then Tony's restaurant uptown in the varsity. And uh, Snack Shack down where the Holiday Inn Express is now, and Harry's out at Five Points. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe it in those days, Claude, that you could buy a, a steak at Harry's for 50 cents. Uh. <laughs> you could get a soft drink for a nickel, uh -huh. get a beer for a mug of beer, for, I think, for a dime or a quarter. Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't drink beer in those days, never yeah. did like it. <laughs> Now, did they have chapel while you were here? How did that operate? There were programs in the chapel, Claude, but, uh, but uh, like a lot of kids, I went to the ba First Baptist Church. I went to Sunday school there because, as we were discussing before this interview began, I was uh, raised, we opened and closed the doors of the church. My mm -hmm. father was a lay minister, just never had to call to full-time Christian service. so. Uh, I was educated to go to church, and so naturally I went to the First Baptist Church. But like most young kids, I never did go to uh, attend any thing that I remember on campus. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but there were, <clears throat> sir, I think there were services at the chapel. Mm -hmm. when, um, when did your college days come to an end, and how did that come about? Well, in 1943, uh, uh, we were shipped, the decision was made to send us to Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning. And so that's where I <coughs> headed after I left the university. And the uh, cavalry were sent up to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and the cavalry was converted to the armored mm -hmm. about that time. And I don't think there were any horses in, <laughs> in World War II, but <laughs> they the still tanks. rode horses here then. Uh -huh. And it was known as the cavalry. And uh -huh. you look back in the annuals and you'll see them, That's right. Right, all the military students wearing the jodfers and the horse barn was out there where the Coliseum hit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize and laugh, and you, I'm sure you remember this, but uh, in, the, in the early 40s, where the Georgia Center is now, those were chicken houses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people laugh, women. 
And uh -huh. where the Coliseum is is where the horse horn was. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, a then, lot of changes. So you went to Fort Benning. I was sent to Fort Benning to Officer County School, and at the time I arrived, they decided that 90 days was not sufficient. If you went through Officer County School, you were called a 90-day wonder. You were made a second lieutenant of infantry. They changed it to uh, four months. And then also, when we arrived, the typical big government, big army, the army hadn't quite communicated to the people at Fort Benning and the Officer Candidate School who we were. Mm -hmm. And so we were assigned to a, an outlanding area at Fort Benning, a huge area. The government owned thousands of acres. Of course, it's been mostly developed now, but back in those days, there were and we were about 10 miles out from the main camp at what was called the Harmony Church area. And, uh, and they just left us there for a couple of months. We did routine military work nearly every day, but we weren't assigned to a class. And so as I look back in it in the long run, that helped me to avoid most of the combat in World War II because I did not graduate from Fort uh, from Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning until uh, November of that year. So I spent four months in Officer Candidate School and several months in pre-OCS. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I was given a 10-day leave and sent to, uh, at orders to go to the European Theater as a replacement officer. And so I went through, took about a month for that, to, all of December. I went to Fort Meade, Maryland to, uh, and they had tailors clawed from New York down the, the, the overcoat that you had, that they, and you've seen pictures of these brown overcoats that they wore back then. And it had to be so many inches from the ground. Well, they measured all this stuff to you, took several weeks to do all that, go through all the physicals and that, then I was shipped up to Camp Miles Standish outside Boston, Massachusetts. And we sailed on the first week in January from Boston. Uh, and I was on the Grace Line South American cruise ship, the Santa Rosa. And it had been converted to a troop carrier. And every available space on it, I think they put where it was a ship that would carry like 3,000 I mean, 300 passengers, when it was a cruise ship, had 2,000 soldiers on it. Every available space was taken from it. Mm -hmm. They took all the furniture out, and in the rooms where officers occupied the rooms, they, where there would be two beds in it for regular cruise ship passengers, they would put eight in there. And the way they did it is they would take uh, pipes, bolt them to the floor and the ceiling, and put four bunks on one side and four bunks on the other. And you had just enough room, if you were a very large person, you didn't have enough room to lie on your side because the person lying on top of you sunk down in the bunk a little uh -huh. bit and you didn't have room to turn over. You'd have about that much space. Uh -huh. So you had to lie flat out. <laughs> so that's the way I went to Europe and it had to go in a convoy. It could not go any faster than the cargo ships. And so it took us two weeks and unloaded us in the English Channel at night because the front had already moved through France, but they're still fearful of German planes uh, attacking a troop ship. And so mm -hmm. we sailed up the English Channel at night and went ashore in a uh, landing craft. It wasn't very mm -hmm. much fun, even though we didn't have uh, anybody shooting at us at that stage of the game. Then you left England, and where did you go? Never yeah, landed in England. We sailed yeah. across the channel in a, in, a, in a convoy, and then at night we'd go up the English Channel, and they unload us about uh, 4 a.m. while it's dark in these uh, landing craft. It, the fronts come down. You go up on the beach, uh, and then they put us in trucks and took us to a staging area, and then I was assigned to the 63rd Infantry Division. And so I served about five months in combat. 
the war was over for all practical purposes, but Germany had not yet surrendered, and we were moving practically every day. Uh, our heaviest combat was in March at the Sea Free Line, mm -hmm. when our division breached the Sea Free Line and let the armor through onto the German Autobahn. And but we got people injured or killed every week, and uh, so from a individual standpoint, there was still peeping sh people shooting at you. Mm -hmm. But now that I look back in the grand strategy of the war, it was over because the German forces were all old men or young boys. Of course, you didn't know that at the time. We didn't know that because they were shooting at us. But uh, right. uh, we knew there was not heavy defenses after we got through the Siegfried line because they would defend these little towns and then fall back. Mm -hmm. And Now, you were fortunate to get a special assignment, right? Um, well, it was first over, first home, and being on there a short time, I did not have enough service in Europe to be first home. Uh, so I got an assignment as special Earth service officer for headquarters command in Frankfurt, which was Supreme Headquarters. General Eisenhower was still the commanding general, and I didn't know anything about that part of the military because I went from the lowest level of the military to the highest level. And so there you were in headquarters, headquarters in command Frankfurt, of the, Frankfurt Germany. Germany. Headquarters command of the service troops for high headquarters. Mm -hmm. And the generals uh, were kind of like the Congress of the United States. <laughs> they established policy. They had an office staff, but didn't have any real power. Folks like me, uh, who well, had the, you know, a lot of people working for us, and we had, uh, we had a thousand, give or take a few Germans, running all the facilities that we had in uh, Frankfurt. We had 12 theaters. Theaters? Uh, theaters, yeah. Uh, enlisted clubs, officers clubs. Uh, we we uh, took over the largest <coughs> uh, soccer stadium in Frankfurt and converted it to what we call Victory Stadium. And when we had my uh, talk about my military service that I did with you several years ago, I told that story about I got a call from Colonel Lee, General Eisenhower's uh, one of his aides, and the military customarily before you go to another unit, the command officer Somebody on his staff speaks to somebody there. And I got a call from uh, Colonel Lee saying that General Eisenhower is going to be entertaining General Patton in a couple of weeks ahead, and they want to come to the football game on Sunday afternoon. We had a lot of uh, college players and college coaches there, and all the armies and the high units had teams, and so we had games on Sunday. And uh, uh, so I arranged for that, and it occurred to me to, and I called him back and said, what about the band playing uh, Happy Birthday, and we announced to the troops that General Patton Eisenhower's, General Eisenhower's guest for his birthday weekend, and have them all sing Happy Birthday to me. And he said, Lieutenant, that's a wonderful idea. You do it. So I still have written out the little line I wrote to announced, and I did that myself on the public address system, yeah. <laughs> just what I told you. Uh -huh. And all the GIs stood, 50,000 of them, and, and General Patton was there in his jodhpurs with his pearl handle pistols on and, and his combat helmet. It was so shiny, oh, it just yeah. reflected in your eyes. <clears throat> General Eisenhower wore his Eisenhower jacket and that cap looked, looked quite different from General Patton. But I got to meet General Patton, General Eisenhower, quite a thrill. That was a short time before, really before General Patton was killed, isn't it? Yes, I, I went to his funeral. He was killed in November. He lived about 10 days. But he was on a, was coming back from his chateau outside Frankfurt. General Eisenhower had assigned him to, to a, what was called a Phantom Army to do a history of World War II. And he lived in a chateau outside Frankfurt, one of the small uh, resort towns. And he had been on a hunting trip that weekend with General Patch, who was commanding general of the 7th Army, whose headquarters was in Heidelberg. 
and he was coming back to uh, Frankfurt at an intersection in Mannheim, and I believe that's where it was, and uh, uh, his car, staff car went through an intersection and a truck hit him, and he lived about uh, 10 days after that. But uh, I like to say about General Patton, if you've got an all-out war, every country needs a guy like General Patton. He had his problems, but he fought to win. Yeah. <laughs> He's still a legend over That's there. That's right. He was legendary. <laughs> but, uh, but his troops liked him, just like uh, Coach Butts was playing at Georgia. Mm -hmm. He was known as a tough taskmaster. But, and on the field he was. But outside he was as kind-hearted as anybody. And mm -hmm. he'd give his old players the shirt off his back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, General Patton is buried there with his Well, troops. he's not buried. He's buried at a military cemetery in France, yes. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the particular one, but uh, mm -hmm. it was tragic it had happened that way. But I guess the war was over and he wouldn't have been happy uh, not having a war to fight, I don't yeah. think. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> you got to know General Eisenhower. Well, I didn't get to, get to know him. Uh, but I got to meet him, and I got to know a good bit. What of was his favorite pastime? Golf, and that's where I first realized that he was a golfer because I got a call. Uh, we had taken over the Frankfurt Country Club, which was the only golf course in Frankfurt at the time. Golf was not very big in Europe at that time, and there was only one course there. And the pro was had been at the at the. Uh, Idlewild Country Club in New Haven, Connecticut. He came back to Germany about 36 or 37, and he was the pro there, and we took it over. A few stray bombs had dropped on the country club because the golf course, because it was in the suburbs. So it was not difficult to bring back to playing conditions. And we had, uh, uh, we had uh, special service, uh, five clubs, and two woods, and three irons and a putter <laughs> for the GIs. But that's where I learned about Eisenhower's interest in golf. Mm -hmm. And he played some there, but not too often. You and finished then, out your military career there? Well, no, I came back, well, yes, I finished there. And uh, I got orders back in July of the year following the war. So I was in Frankfurt from about uh, September till July of the next year. And an unusual thing happened there. Uh, a shipping strike was on, and I had orders to return to the United States and be discharged, but there were no ships to bring us home. So I was uh, stationed at La Havre, France, where they had staging areas for us to board the ships. And we would go back and forth to Paris and read the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune, which was the English language newspaper mm. for Europe at the time, and uh, see what was happening. And I, I told you that story at the time, I think it's worth, worth repeating. I was born in Tifton, Georgia, as we mentioned. And my friend, my family were good friends with the Myers family, who owned the Myon Hotel in Tifton, the leading hotel. Their son was Henry Myers, who became the first presidential pilot. He was a pilot for Roosevelt, and I read in the Herald Tribune that he was bringing Secretary of State Jimmy Burns from South Carolina to Paris, his delegation, for a peace a conference, and it was going to return taking some GIs. So I had never met Colonel Myers myself, but I knew, you know, knew his family, and I contacted the American Embassy to see if I could talk with him and get on board that uh, flight. And by the time I got, uh, did get in touch with Henry Myers, he told me that they were already booked, and so I missed getting return on the president's plane, the sacred cow, as it was known <laughs> in those days. Uh, uh, a four-engine, I think, constellation that they flew across the ocean in those days. But Roosevelt didn't like flying. He liked ships because he was Secretary of the Navy. And as you remember, he went to most of his uh, meetings by ship because he preferred that. So 
you finally did get back. I came back. Uh, I came <laughs> back to uh, to New York. Got to sail in uh, New York Harbor by the Statue of Liberty. Returned down to uh, to North Carolina and was discharged there. Given a train ticket back to Gainesville, and so I got back around the first of August of uh, 1946. You and returned that, to Gainesville. Uh, and then that's when I decided that I wanted to be in the radio business. And I contacted L.H. Christian, who'd gotten out of the Navy. And his first job was in Gainesville working for WGGA as an engineer. And he did not go to college. He helped put WGAU on the air in, in the late 30s. And uh, that's where I met him because my mother and a friend had a program out there called Old Familiar Favorites. She played the piano and they sang, and they had a 15-minute program on uh, WGGA, the only radio station in Gainesville, and I would occasionally go out with her, and I'd met L.H., and so I found out where he was, and he'd gotten out of the Navy and was in Elberton working as an engineer. So I drove over to see him and told him, and I said, there's a second radio station coming up in Gainesville, which I have an opportunity to invest in and be a part of, and I think Athens was a much bigger community, and with the university here and all the sports, I think it would be a better market for a second radio station. And uh, he said, well, I've been thinking about the same thing. So that's how we got together. And we applied for the station, took about a year to get the application, and we went on the air. And we were purely a local station. WGAU was a CBS bonus station, and uh, they brought all the CBS radio network and didn't do any local program. So we put on lo all local programming, news, sports. Uh, and back then, radio had a little something in the course of a day for everybody. We had uh, country music, we had classical music, we had jazz, uh, we had uh, sports, news. Now it's gotten fragmented and specialized. Mm -hmm. and now, when did you marry? When did you get married? Well, I came back and uh, uh, as I said, in August of 1946. And my sister told me that there's a young lady you need to meet. They have moved here since you've been away in the service and live two doors from us. In Gainesville. In Gainesville. And her father is the Ford dealer here. He bought the Ford dealership from O.D. Grimes here in Athens who owned the dealership in, in Gainesville and also owned the Buick agency here. And... Uh, uh, we want you to, I want you to meet her. So we met at church uh -huh. on a Sunday or two after I got home. And uh, we married in September of 1947, the year we put the... Now, uh, she was Charlotte. She was Charlotte Leverett. Mm -hmm. and her father. She has two degrees from the University right. of Georgia, and uh, she was a professor here for daughter, 17 years. Yes, Charlotte went to Bernal. Her mm -hmm. father thought that the university was Phoenix too Center. wild and she needed to go to, at first she went to Shorter College mm -hmm. in Rome, which was a Baptist school and a girls college. And then when they moved to Gainesville, she switched to Bernal. And our daughter Lynn had a speech impediment and that's what started Charlotte's interest in, in going back to school. And being here in Athens, it's easier to do than it is in some places. So. Uh, she took Lynn over to the College of Education to see if she could get some help with the speech impediment. Met Catherine Blake, a number of other people, Louise McBee, <laughs> and became you know, great friends with them. And one thing led to another, and so she started taking some courses, and they said, well, uh, got a master's degree, and then they wanted her to continue, and so children were beginning to get a little older, and we had some good help at home, and so one thing led to another, and she got a doctorate in education. And uh, when uh, Catherine was made uh, dean of the College of Education, Catherine Blake, uh, she asked Solid to be the associate dean. And they Fred out, fell out with Fred Davison over a budget matter. <laughs> and uh, Catherine went back to teaching, and Charlotte Lynn was moving back to Athens and happy for him to establish his practice. So fortunately, my business was going good, and we were. Uh, and she didn't have to teach from a monetary standpoint, and mm -hmm. things were getting uh, political at that time. And so she just decided to retire, and so she left and 
80 or 81, I've forgotten the exact year. 80, I think it was. You had two great children. Thank you. Tell us about them. Well, it's Sandy and Lynn, and uh, Sandy is our oldest, uh, very bright young man, and uh, I like to say to people that uh, if I've imparted anything worthwhile to my children, it's uh, a little common sense, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, how to go with the flow. Charlotte always had, uh, was more uh, studious than I was, and uh, made good grades and she always insisted on them. Uh, and I encouraged them in that too, but uh, Sandy went to, was obviously very bright as a young child. And so he, we did everything we could to enhance his growing up. And he was in the first governor's honor school, which was created. It was down at Mercer at, at the time. and. Uh, then his senior year in high school, he got a National Science Foundation grant and went to Cornell University for six weeks. And uh, we put him on a plane, he went to New York, had to change to go to Ithaca, New York, and he was, uh, <laughs> and flying wasn't as common as it was in those days. Uh -huh. And uh, he did well, we went up and picked him up and visited some Ivy League colleges. And so he wound up going to Princeton as an undergraduate and uh, then decided it was a graduate in the Woodrow Wilson School of International Affairs. Uh, but he decided he wanted to go into medicine so he came back to Duke and got his medical degree from Duke. And, and he's still there, right? Well, he went out to Dallas for, he got an offer to go to Dallas as chairman of cardiology at UT Southwestern. Uh, big Texas medical school and he was out there for 11 years and then he got an opportunity to come back to Duke as dean of the medical school and so he's still at Duke. And our daughter Lynn did not want to go the way to school, she wanted to go the way to come to Georgia and she did and we encouraged her to live on campus to give her a, a more college feeling because you stay at home and go to school it's like being a commuter mm -hmm. and so uh, she lived on campus and uh, met uh, uh, Happy Dix, who was a star football player at the time, and uh, and they married and have three children, three boys. Sandy has three children, a daughter, who's our only granddaughter, and has two sons. And uh, we've been very fortunate. They are yeah. all wonderful people. Now Sandy is vice chancellor. He's uh, vice chancellor Duke for University. medical affairs medical. now, which is a, uh, he, uh, they have a chancellor for medical affairs, which is in charge of the hospitals and the medical school. And they own quite a number of hospitals, Duke does. They bought the public hospital in Durham, Durham County Hospital. They operate it in addition to, to, Duke, to Duke Hospital. And then they have a hospital in uh, Raleigh. They bought a hospital in Raleigh that they operate and then they have clinics in several places around North Carolina. But uh, uh, we're proud of him. He's yeah, been able to accomplish a great deal in his life. Uh -huh. and, uh, and um Lynn's uh, husband, she married a football player instead of an academician. And did. what did he end up doing, driving a truck or what? Uh, no, he didn't. <laughs> uh, he was influenced by a man named Ken Carrington who went to Michigan, played football at Michigan, was a, was a, uh, uh, sometimes I'm having a, a senior, a neurosurgeon, and it's, which is what my son-in-law Happy wound up being. But Ken Carrington being a big football fan, and you may be aware of this because of your association with with the athletic program at Georgia, Claude, but uh, he became friends with Vince Dooley, they, he and his wife, and they were real good friends. And he adopted Georgia as his second, as his second school to Michigan. And he was a neurosurgeon in Augusta, a very prominent neurosurgeon. And he invited football players to come down and he had a farm outside Augusta where he lived and raised cattle and he would bring football players down in the summer to work at his farm. 
play with his children and, and just get to know them. And so one summer, Happy and Tom Nash, a uh, teammate of Happy, a prominent attorney in Augusta, I mean in Savannah now, uh, worked down there one summer. And Happy's on the cover of a Georgia football pra program taken in the barn down there when he was pitching hay, he and Tom. But that's how he got interested in neurosurgery, and so he went to Michigan and spent six years there and did a residency, internship and residency in neurosurgery, and then came back to Athens to establish his practice. And he practiced for 25 years, very demanding profession because about half of what you do are dealing with life-threatening injuries. The other half are elective surgery that you have a, a better than 50-50 chance of it being successful. But when you're dealing with gunshot wounds and brain injuries and uh, accident surgery as they have to deal with, it's a very trying profession. And he had a bad back from football and it was a type of uh, medical profession that you just can't do part time. You've either got to do it or you can't do it. So he retired several years ago, but after 25 years of practicing neurosurgery here in Athens. And he's been involved with uh, St. Mary's as a part-time volunteer worker, and uh, they have a home, he's an avid golfer, and they have a home up at the Cashers, North Carolina, and they spend most of the summer up there. But they're very active in the First Presbyterian Church here. Mm -hmm. We were talking about before they started my, we were Baptist, and uh, Happy's family are Methodist, and the same thing with my wife's uh, I mean, my, our son's a w w wife, they were Methodists. And so our children became Presbyterians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, as long as they're in the church and we're all pursuing the same yeah, thing, right. that's... And so you have how many grandchildren? I have six grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Three great. Lynn's oldest lives in Atlanta, Alec Dix, 35, and they have a l little girl, eight, Oh. Uh, seven and a little boy, three. Mm -hmm. oh. Did any of the grandchildren come to Georgia? Or? Uh, Claude Dix, my namesake, mm -hmm. came to Georgia, graduated from the journalism school. And, uh, and Alec Dix got his uh, master's in business here mm -hmm. at Georgia, but he went to Dartmouth as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's quite a bright. So you have three generations. Uh huh. Who, uh, well, go back George further than that because my mother's family, her brother, Abbott Nix, who was a prominent yeah. attorney here in Athens, and the first initiate, by the way, clawed into gridiron here. Is He's that got right? the gridiron number one. That is, which is great. Quite, yeah. Uh, something. And he joined, the, he went to, to uh, the University of Georgia and graduated in 1912 from Georgia. And then he went to Harvard Law School and came back and practiced with the Irwin Law Firm. Mr. Will and Mr. Howell Irwin. It was Irwin and Irwin and then it became Irwin, Irwin and Dix. Mm -hmm. And young Howell Irwin Jr. is probably the one you and I knew the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Buddy Allen's wife was one of mm -hmm. Howell Irwin's daughters. That he, so Pro that's a forward generation legacy. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. really great. My father, my grandfather, though, Mr. Morgan Nix in commerce, went to North Georgia College. Uh huh. How about that? So yeah. <laughs> we go back to the 1870s up yeah. there. It was an agricultural college at that time. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the University of Georgia has been uh, a key ingredient in our lives for many, many years. And mm -hmm. Well. You um, wanted to come here. You're sort of the <coughs> living uh, ingredient or representative of journalism. You were in uh, print media. How did you get in newspaper business? Uh, kind of by accident. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, I like the media business, and of course, grew up went to the journalism school and followed it very closely. And uh, in the early 50s, I uh, was looking uh, to expand my interest. And I 
began an ad agency here, and D.D. Say was building the Beechwood Shopping Center, first shopping center in Athens. And I was able to persuade him to let me handle the advertising, and at that time, the Banner Herald only reached about 25 or 30 percent of the homes in Athens, and very little outside of Athens. And so I felt like they needed broader coverage in that, and so I planned this shopper publication for them. <clears throat> and Say so put funds into it, and the merchants out there contributed too. And so for the first year, we sent we weekly tabloid-sized publications, all advertising on the Beechwood Shopping Center, to 30,000 homes in Athens and Clark County and the surrounding counties. Well, after the first year, they decided not to continue that. But I had quite a number of people, other businesses, ask me to, if they could advertise in this. And I said, well, no, it's a, strictly a Beechwood publication. So when they did not want to renew, I created the Advertiser, which was a shopping publication. Had no hard news. Uh, it was uh, a feature publication to talk about people, places, and things. And I had a lot of, Mary Ann Hodson contributed to it. Uh, we had a society column by Gwen Griffin. Uh, we had a lot of local writers contributed columns to it. Manel Causey. And so that's how I got in the newspaper business. And uh, so we published that every week. And we decided to put it on a subscription basis, and then we would distribute others to the non-subscribers uh, free. Uh, and then uh, I met Millard Grimes at the Georgia press meeting at the Georgia Center, and we got to kicking around the idea. And he's really the one who gave me the idea, said, why don't we just convert this to a paper? And I said, well, I'm an advertising guy, not a publisher or a editor, and would you come up here and run it? And he said, yeah, I'd do that. So that's the way the deal started, and Miller's wife put the kibosh on that. Charlotte is her name, too, mm -hmm. and, she, and her mother lived with them at the time, and she just said, you know, I just can't move from Columbus. He was uh, working for the Columbus Ledger Inquirer. So I, by that time, we'd put a structure together, an organization, and ordered a press, and I said, well, Millard, you got to find somebody to edit this paper for me. And so we found Glenn Vaughn, Glenn and Nancy Vaughn. And it was a great choice, and they did a wonderful job. And had we had uh, a good permanent long-term financing, we would have probably still be here. But the Morrises wanted to buy it from the day after they bought the Banner Herald. Billy Myers called me, and we got together about three years later and sold it to them. Smiley Wolf was my banker at the CNS Bank, and I'd always counsel with him. And he said, well, when you and your partners think y'all have been well paid for your work and effort, sell it to him. And <laughs> <laughs> I told uh, Smiley later, I said, you know, you loaned us a lot more money than I believe I would had I been sitting on your side of the desk. And I want to thank you for it. And he said, his response was, well, we got paid, didn't we? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but by the skin of your teeth sometimes. Uh -huh. But I told him my dad's story. And I said, uh -huh. you don't have to worry about us going bankrupt. You, you may take a while to get your money. But, uh -huh. uh, but uh, so it, worked, you, it worked out well. You were in um, news, um, radio business. Radio, you were in the news newspaper. business. You were advertising. I used the outdoor advertising. I liked outdoor advertising. And I used it for clients, for businesses uh, that I was involved with. And I talked to F.H. Williams, no relation to me, mm -hmm. Fish Williams. He and his sister-in-law owned Athens Postal Advertising Company. And I told him I, several times, if you ever want to sell it, let me know. Well, I didn't know a whole lot about that business. Well, finally, he called me one day and said, we are interested in selling it. And this was in 1964. And Bob Maupin had returned to Athens. His father owned a narrow fabric company. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they made uh, the elastic for women's panties, a very successful business. They sold it to a big company, 
they told Bob and Jimmy Maupin that we'll give you a lifetime contract if you'll sell it to them. And they moved them to Rhode Island where they were based. Well, a year later, they fired them both. <laughs> Declared them legally dead, as Bob used to say, and, and gave them a year's pay. And that Bob returned to Athens and was looking for something to do. And so I uh, told him about this offer, and he and I bought Athens Poster from F.H. Williams. And I owned 50 percent, and he owned. I was running the newspaper, and the business, and advertising side, and, and he, he didn't know anything about the advertising the outdoors. So we were just learning it together. But we bought it from F. H. Williams. Uh, found out later from industry sources, from other people, it was a family business then, and families all over Georgia owned these outdoor companies. This business was started here in 1918. I know that. 1964. And uh, I found out we paid too much for it. <laughs> because none of, all of them wanted to buy it, but they wouldn't pay what he wanted for. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, uh, but I did get him to finance it, and so we, part of it for us, and so we bought it. And then after we sold the newspaper, and Bob had died, and so I found the business just, wasn't big enough to suit me, and so I expanded the outdoor advertising business. And went on from there, and then in 85, I sold all, I sold all my outdoor companies and uh, decided to get in the banking business. I would borrowed so much money from banks, and a group of us started the Georgia National Bank in 1988. I was chairman of it, and we operated it for 10 years and sold it to South Trust in Birmingham, and then uh, in 2000, a, a group wanted to start another local bank and asked me to help them, and so I didn't want to be as involved as I was before, but I was an organizer of the National Bank of Georgia, and I retired in 06 as a director of that because I served on banking boards for 35 years, yeah. and I'd had enough of meetings, and, uh -huh. and, uh, and that's the way I am now. I, I want to support all the organizations which I believe in. And, have worked with over a mm -hmm. lifetime, but I don't want to be on any committees, mm -hmm. and I don't want to go to any long-winded meetings. <laughs> what are some of your involvements in the community through the years and now? Claude, I've shared this with my children, and I think it's a, it's a philosophy that took me a long time to realize. But most people in business uh, find themselves being involved in too many things and you have to be joiners and you can't do justice to all of that and so I've always felt like that you had a responsibility to your family I was taught that uh, you have a responsibility to your church you have a responsibility to your business and those are the big three and so I decided about midway in my career when I was trying to balance a bunch of balls and being involved. As you know, if you're active in organizations and you'll do things, you'll continue to be asked. And a few people wind up doing most of the civic work. And uh, so I decided I would take one outside responsibility and one minor at a time, nothing else. And I learned how to say no. And I just say I have, this is my philosophy. I am active in the Chamber of Commerce or the United Way or the Alzheimer's or the Heart Foundation. I was chairman of the first heart fund here. Good Lord Irwin, when, when the health agencies had to leave the United Way and community chest because the local organizations were getting most of the money and they were coming up short. Uh, so heart and cancer pulled out. They were the two biggest of the United Ways and Community Chest oh, 30 years ago and did their own. And I've learned something about fundraising is that you have to, it's, it's like farming, you've got to do the planning and preparation. and. And you've got to educate people to what it is you're trying to accomplish. And fundraising for these organizations, the university is a good example. 
operates exactly the same way the university fundraising is. You get people involved and you educate them as to what the needs are. And if they don't know that, they're not going to be as inclined to give or participate. And that's where a fundraising campaign is effective. And so we began the first heart campaign. We got $3,500, and I've forgotten what year, the late 70s. We were getting $3,500 from the community chest, it was known as in those days. Uh, we raised 12000 the first year. Now, cancer and heart raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. They would not get anything like that if they were part of the United Way is good in a way, and it you can combine a lot of the local organizations because there's, there's just a limit to so many, how many fundraising campaigns you can conduct. Mm -hmm. But nobody's going to give as much to one single cause as they will to causes that they have involvement in. If you've got heart disease in your family, you're going to be more likely to be mm -hmm. actively involved and give of your resources to heart fund. Cancer is the same way whatever else you want to name. Mm -hmm. But I've been involved over the years with all of those. I'm still a member of the Chamber of Commerce. I was former president and chairman, always been very active in the chamber. I'm still a member, but I don't go to any meetings to do anything <laughs> <laughs> because of what I before. They're too long and too wordy, and you leave and no, nothing's ever accomplished. Yeah. Uh, I'm well, a de deacon emeritus at the church. Uh, uh, been a Baptist deacon for see, 60 years, I guess. Mm. They elected you very young. Yes, they did. <laughs> but I was active. I was there. You know, you're visible. You know how that is. If you're there and you're helping open the church door, <laughs> so every time it opens, you, you get, to, right. <laughs> you get you called on one. to do some things. <laughs> Claude, you have been here and seen so many changes. I've been here part of the time and they've just been amazed um, when I came back after finishing here and then being away for 10 years at what had happened to Athens and the university and hadn't stopped. It just keeps on and on. Um, what, what do you think about that and see about all of these changes in well, Athens today and the future? Most of my perspective comes from a business background, but in talking with other business people around the state and in Athens, of course, and in comparing numbers, which I like to do, uh, I have family connections back to Gainesville. My sister lived in Dalton. I have friends in Albany and Waycross and Valdosta and Brunswick, and former business associates and so on, Columbus, Bacon, Augusta, and I keep up with that. Athens is very blessed in that the university is relatively stable. It's more, doesn't have the ups and downs that the business cycle does. It goes with it to some extent as we're experiencing now. But we have almost record attendance at the university despite the mm -hmm. budget problems that they're having and the furloughing and those sort of, that, that sort of thing. So Athens never experiences the economic highs that most other communities of our size do, nor we do, do we experience the lows. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best way to describe it. Gainesville now, on the other hand, was a fraction of the business community size, any way you know to measure it, it was Athens when I was growing up and in the early years of my business life. But Gainesville has grown to be a better business community than Athens. It's more entrepreneurial. Uh, it started with the poultry, and textiles was big in Gainesville when I was growing up. And then Jesse Jewell founded the poultry business as we know it today. And then there have been a lot of other businesses that have come into Gainesville, small businesses over the years. But I followed banking for 25 years very closely. The assets of the banks in Athens, and I don't follow it to that degree anymore, a few years ago were half as again as, as much as they were in Athens. That surprises a lot of people. 
uh, Hall County is a lot bigger geographically mm -hmm. and a lot bigger population-wise than Athens. There are more people in Hall County than there are in the Athens metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. And Gainesville's now been declared in this last census a statistical metropolitan area. Uh, but the, the university is the anchor here. There are no two ways about it. The, the university was the reason Athens exists. Mm -hmm. There was nothing here when they came That's up right. here from Watkinsville and planted their flag over there on the, mm -hmm. at Cedar Shoals on the banks of the Oconee River and said, this is where we'll build our university. We want to be out where people can study and not be influenced by all the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> other things that uh, we now have. Right. But uh, I think that's a simple explanation of where we are and where we'll find ourselves for the future because mm -hmm. I don't think uh, Athens has been blessed to having a, a, a good diversity of small industries. And mm -hmm. that's the way it ought to be. And I yeah. think the high tech, the things associated with the university is where Athens is going to grow. And, uh, this is the engine that drives Athens and surrounding area. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, you have certainly been blessed in your um, in your personal life. I uh, have been fantastic uh, business career. I thank the Lord every day uh, for that. Living Lord. example of journalism at work, the print, thank the you. broadcasting, the public relations, and the advertising, which is the major divisions of journalism and then add to that banking <laughs> which makes it all grow. You'll be interested in this. Cully Clark, uh, relatively new dean of the journalism school and of course I uh, always like to meet and get to know the deans and Mark Smith and myself uh, had a little luncheon to introduce the dean to the media people several years ago and he asked me, he said, oh, tell me a little bit about your you know, kind of like we're doing here today, but not mm -hmm. anything like this Dell. Right. And I said, well, uh, there are a few things that stand out in my journalism career as far as the University of Georgia is concerned. And the thing I'm the proudest of is the, the Dean John E. Drury. And I have a letter which I will share with you because I've saved it in my files. Don't have too many letters that go back that far. But I have a letter from Gene Dr Dean Drury offering me a job. <laughs> so I never thought of myself as a teacher. Uh -huh. And I very uh, thanked him profusely for the offer, but told him at that time my business situation was such that I couldn't even spare the time to be an adjunct professor and come over here occasionally. But I was flattered by the offer. Mm -hmm. And he got to be kicked out yeah. of that. <laughs> and, right. Uh, well, that's a fantastic career, wonderful life. And, oh, thank you. Uh, the university itself is proud of you. As an alumnus, thank I'm you. proud of you thank too. You. And um, as Dean uh, McBee said when we were interviewing her, and uh, our interviewer said, it's, uh, you've done so many <laughs> things and it's been great. And she said, well, I'm not done yet. So. Well, I'm proud to Claude Louise, our, our friend, over uh -huh. all these years. And, Wonderful lady. And obviously you share that same philosophy. What a, a wonderful example of a... Thank you. Well, my mother and father London taught you to give back to the community and the institutions in which you've uh, been blessed by. And well, that's great. Certainly the University of Georgia has been a big part of our lives and will continue to be. Great. And,